Welcome to the panel on cinematic virtual reality. It's my first time moderating a panel, so this is going to be fun. Um, we have uh, a slight a, a change in the uh, people that are sitting on the panel today. Uh, uh, we have Tony Parisi, or, uh, sorry, I should uh, start from uh, your left. Um, we have Jim Geldick from uh, uh, GoPro. Uh, sorry, what is uh, your your role again? It's a tough one. I cover a lot, but uh, basically, um, a cinema uh, broadcast and photo, which VR falls under that kind of advanced technology use cases of our cameras and software, which a lot of people use a lot of GoPros for capturing VR content. Yeah, let me just uh, get out my notes. So <laughs> I should have started with this. <laughs> um, and then uh, to his right, we have. Uh, Daniel Berman, Director of Experience for Jaunt, uh, which makes 360 cameras like the Neo. He was a founder of uh, Cognito Comics, which was a startup that used uh, emerging technologies to tell stories in new ways, where they worked on a 210-page interactive novel for the iPad. And he also consulted for USC, Disney, Lucasfilm, uh, and was an environment artist for Activision, and uh, vehicle modeler for EA, among other nice. things. To his right, we have uh, Tony Parisi, who is stepping in for Neville Spiteri from Weaver. Tony is the VP of Platform Products for Weaver. And to his right, we have uh, Alex Barter, co-managing partner at VRWorks which is a game and live action experience developer, publisher, production, and distribution company. They're working on a, a paranormal activity experience. Game. 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 Full game. Coming out in May. Yeah. Oh. A um, console and PC near you. Yeah, so <laughs> I, I like, so these are our rock star panelists. And now I was hoping maybe you could each give a short 30, 30 second summary of the projects and technologies that you're working on in case the uh, audience is not familiar. I guess I get to start? Yes. Um, so for anybody that doesn't know, GoPro, we make cameras. <laughs> we, make, uh, we make probably a very popular camera. Um, camera. Yeah, it is the most popular camera. It's the most versatile camera, too. Um, so our history has kind of changed. Uh, we've obviously started off with uh, small form factor high resolution cameras. Uh, those have evolved. Uh, we started working off with uh, uh, arrays uh, earlier on, kind of around 2011-ish, 2012, where we had some linear arrays. Uh, we had a very uh, smart gentleman named Tim McMillan. A lot of people know Tim for kind of pioneering uh, time slice array, bullet time, people know that. Uh, so Tim built the first GoPro uh, linear array. That same syncing technology kind of morphed into um, being able to uh, create a spherical capture rig, which you've probably all have either hacked your own or made your own or have seen them uh, over the years. And GoPro, uh, as of last year or the end, beginning of this year, has announced that we are um, actually making uh, spherical capture devices, one of them being with our partners at Google for the Odyssey rig, which is the first jump ready camera. Um, and we also announced at Recode earlier this year that we are coming out with a six camera sync solution for spherical image capture early next year. Um, so we also acquired uh, Color, uh, which is a stitching software, um, probably one of the most popular ones, uh, and um, capable player, uh, Color Eyes, which is a mobile uh, and desktop player for um, being able to play back spherical content. Um, Everybody also knows that we have kind of gotten into the entertainment business in the past year and a half. Um, so there's two kind of a duality with GoPro is that we have our hardware and software business and we also have GoPro Entertainment um, kind of getting, uh, expanding past what everybody knows us for being the kings of short form content kind of, you know, get you inspired, get your ass off the couch and get out there and experience your life and hopefully you're capturing that with the GoPro as well and sharing it. Um, now we're trying to do the same thing uh, for immersive content is to basically help solve what has not been an end-to-end -end solution out there 
it's been a very fractured workflow. Uh, I come from the background of cinematography and visual effects. Uh, I went through the rise and fall of stereoscopic back in 09 and there, you know, a few years ago. Um, seems just like yesterday. But um, nowadays, we're, we're seeing that the uptick in the past two and a half years into kind of immersive VR, AR uh, image capture and delivery has obviously has everybody here today wanting to know more about it. Um, so that's kind of what we're, we're doing. We're here saying that we're, we're supporting the community. We're backing it, just like a lot of people and a lot of companies here today, um, to help solve those problems in uh, capture and delivery. Great. That's a little longer than 30 seconds. <laughs> but hey, I ran long. I ran long. Uh, yeah, Daniel, can you, can you talk a little bit about what Jaunt does a, l a little shorter than... <laughs> no problem. Sure, no problem. Th thanks, Cosmo. Uh, so for those who haven't heard of Jaunt, uh, we're one of the more visible companies in the space. Uh, we also, well, I would say that's our mission is to provide the comprehensive end-to-end -end solution uh, for capturing, <laughs> editing, and playing back and distributing uh, spherical video or cinematic VR, as we're calling it uh, today. So. Um, John's role really is in trying to provide tools for creators and trying to make that uh, an easy ecosystem to work with and really enabling the, the quick iteration that's necessary now, I think, for us to really establish the grammar of this emerging medium. So my job as, as director of experience is to make sure everything that people interact with, from our tools to my most passionate piece of it, the content, uh, is a good experience and it feels uh, inviting and interesting and adds value to your life and isn't just a, a no forgettable novelty. Okay, uh, Weaver, uh, some folks might know about us. We're a both content creator and technology provider. Uh, has anybody here seen the HTC Vive demos? We've done uh, one of the flagship demos for the Vive, the Blue Encounter. Uh, you may have seen the Android version of the Blue, which is uh, running on Gear VR as well, won some Proto Awards this year. Um, we've also done a great experience on the Vive with Lionsgate Entertainment, John Wick, which has just been written up, you know, very cinematic kind of content stuff on one side of the business and very much focused on storytelling forms of content, both video and uh, interactive engine-based content. And we also have a video player that we've been developing for the last year. We haven't released it to the public yet, but we've been building some of our own experiences in it. So this is a high performance, you know, HD video player that runs on all the devices from the mobile up to the Vive, includes some interaction like the ability to gaze at hotspots and trigger moving into another part of the video or trigger transitions. And we're going to be rolling that out as a platform to content creators sometime next year. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Are we okay? Are we awake? Yeah? <laughs> doing okay? All right. So, uh, so I'm Alex Barter. I co-manage with my partner, Russell Neftel, who's back there. Uh, a, uh, we're a multi-platform company. One is Beast Media Group, which is the umbrella. And underneath Beast, we have a company called VRWorks, which is focused specifically on virtual reality, both gaming and live action. We're doing the Paranormal Activity uh, game, which is coming out in May or June uh, of next year, uh, which is awesome. And uh, our game demo happens to be here. If anybody wants to try it out, you guys should, because we're going to close it down at about 6 p.m., uh, and it's gone forever. Just kidding. It'll be somewhere. Um, the, uh, what's also really cool is at 8.20 tonight, we're, we're getting on a British Air Airways flight to head to Italy to shoot what we think is one of the first, if not the first, virtual reality feature-length movies, uh, which is amazing. Our crew is about 125 people. We have 800 extras. The, the, the movie is uh, it's, it's quite amazing. It's basically uh, the passion of the Christ in 360, which is unbelievable. Now, obviously, it's not literally passion of the Christ, although our executive producer happens to be the executive producer of Passion of the Christ. Our, our chief religious advisor happens to be, happens to be have been uh, Mel Gibson's uh, main religious advisor for Passion of the Christ. Uh, it's it's going to be an amazing project. The, the, the whole notion of it is how do you transport people? And VR has this unique ability to transport people to another place, another time. What is the most, what, if you ask you know, 100 people what's the most important moment in the history of the world, they would say the birth of Jesus, the, the crucifixion of Jesus, uh, and, and we're going to take you through all that, and it's going to be 100 minutes or so, or whatever it ends up being, and we think it's one of the first ones, and we're incredibly excited about it, and we'll be there uh, tomorrow night, and it's going to freaking rock. Do you, ex do you expect people to stay in VR for 100 minutes? The, uh, so, so the way we're going to structure it, it'll be, you know, obviously we're doing the birth and the, we're doing the whole, the, the core, the, you know, the, the big moments, right? But the birth and the crucifixion and when he's, being, he's walking down the alley with the, with the cross on his back and, and you know, the, 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 
Last Supper. So the idea is people will be able to experience each one as a segment. But when you, you could watch them all the way through, and it's one continuous through line. Uh, but you'll be able to put it on and off. Uh, the, you'll be able to watch, have the HMD on and off as you're, uh, as you're uh, watching it. It's going to be cool. amazing. Now, here's what's really cool about this, <laughs> is that unlike everybody else, we're moving the camera. The camera's moving. We have visual effects. Uh, we, we've been exploring a lot of solutions, and the, and the challenge out there we've seen is nobody moves the camera. Every the camera's sitting in the middle of the room, and you've got to look around. And, and you know, our background, respectively, Russell uh, ran digital at Endemol Worldwide and worked for Peter Goober, and I, I've produced, distributed or, hundred, or financed 100 plus movies. And so, so our experience is literally monetization of content. And you have to create a AAA experience that people will pay for. The problem with a lot of VR today is nobody's paying for a three and a half minute experience. It's great, but so we, we got to turn this business into a monetizable business, something that will actually grow it and make everybody money. That's, Is, that's what, do you, what, do you guys, what do you guys think about moving the camera? He, he, he made a kind of a, a big deal about that, but uh, is that something that is that okay or we do it. That, we just did it yeah. with we just did it with uh, Nabil on the uh, the weekend at Eminem uh, where we had a, a roving rig, you know yeah. yeah, the cameras need to move. They yeah. don't need Absolutely. to be stationary. there's uh, there's uh, I don't want to say there's limitations in VR at all because there are none. there's guidelines. Um, that we should kind of be aware of. What are those guidelines? Um, it's, you know, I think they're being written every day, but there are some ones that you want to follow of, of, you know, a lot of people have talked about it today. We've talked about it, I think, at a few of these panels that have come up over the past few months is, you know, having that responsibility of the user's experience, you know. Um, being like a shepherd of it? Yeah, you know, people, some people have motion sickness, some people have different effects on them, you know, content affects people differently, whether it be emotionally or... Yeah, but uh, why, why have guidelines? Why set rules now? Well, well it's still developing. Well, because I mean, that's how all content, I think, works over time, is you establish grammar so that the audience can understand what it is. And I think the key difference, and we were talking about this at AFI last weekend, is that, you know, coming from the film side, where we've had an established grammar for, like, many decades, and you get to work within that grammar to make content, Anybody making content today is actually establishing grammar, and the mindset of that is very different. And I think the challenge that we face with that is that there's going to be a lot of failure, there's going to be a lot of mistakes, or not even to call mistakes and isn't the right word. There's going to be things that just aren't successful for whatever reason. People don't feel emotionally tied to the experience, or they feel nauseous, or it just isn't compelling. And we have to be able to, to learn from those pieces of content or those grammar, you know, those grammar yeah, except, except here, pieces. Here's the problem, is that Film has evolved since 1900, or whenever the first film was, it's evolved. It used to be black and white, there was no audio. People said, mm -hmm. when, when, when people were, were there going to be talkies, uh, this is going to change everything, people aren't going to want to watch that. It, it all evolved, and we're all going to have to evolve. I just think, I think the problem I have is, and I really respect everything that you guys are saying, is that, is that at the end of the day, if we're this early, and it's not day one, it's day negative five. Right. If we're this Too early, early and we're saying that there are rules or guidelines or whatever else, we don't want to stifle the, fil the, the creators out here that are, gonna, that, that are gonna create content that we never even imagined. As cool as we all think we are, and as cool as we all think our content is, and it's really cool, um, there's somebody out here that's gonna come up with something that breaks all the guidelines, that breaks all the rules, that's gonna innovate, and obviously the nausea, we have gotta get past this. Obviously we gotta, we gotta solve it, but that can't be the thing that guides the creativity and the narrative. It's storytelling. There, there's a whole people. lot of people saying, yeah, no locomotion, and it really is stifling storytelling. Our game, that, that so, 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 our, so our game demo, we were out with our game demo in, in 15 cities around the country with HTC and AMC theaters and, and Paramount and NVIDIA and everybody else that, that was part of it. Um, we had thousands of people who played our game demo. Not one person had complained about being nauseous, not one. Not one that at least we heard of. And, and one of the HTC guys was here, Vivek, and he confirmed that today. There were 300 well, that, people that That means you're stuff. doing something right, which is great. Right, what, but, right exactly. But, but I think we all figure that out. I think the nausea is something that the creators will figure out. And I think that we gotta, we got to look past it. I think you guys should be moving your camera more. I think everybody should be moving. I don't disagree with you. Camera. I think that, again, it's, you know, it, it's a combination of establishing techniques and trying to create an experience for somebody. And for me, it's not about limitations so much as it's what am I saying by do, using the tool in this way. Yeah. And to me, that's the missing mindset of what's being done in, in VR content right now is yeah. trying to unravel that a bit and kind of assign meaning to it. I mean, the problem with, to me, I don't want to call it a problem, the, the blind spot to me is that the grammar of film is completely taken for granted. We weren't around the, when that was being established. We just inherited it all. Anybody working in film has inherited their interest, industry, and that, to me, is the danger. That is the blind spot. 
So that's not to say that that's you know going to be a problem going forward. We just need to be mindful of what of what that means. Yeah. Yeah. The, and that being said, moving the camera is one of the few cinematic tools we know actually works, exactly. <laughs> and we've got to use it in VR. It's, it's one of the biggest storytelling tools we have right yeah, now. Yeah. I think our, our drone footage and you know my personal favorite is drone footage in North Face where we fly the camera around. I'm like, this is Absolutely. awesome. So. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So. I was hoping uh, you guys could walk the audience through what pre-production, production, and post-production looks like in VR compared to uh, shooting a traditional uh, movie or film for uh, you know some people who are maybe not familiar with you know how that works in VR. How many people here actually are familiar with uh, just video workflow in the audience? Like how sad? Okay, so a fair amount of you guys. Um, so I think the bigger, this is a general generality, because I'll be the first to admit I'm not directly on the content side right now, I'm on the tool side trying to help that process along. Um, those tools have, are also very mature and very accessible, and the expectation of our uh, people coming into the space, especially from film, is that they're used to shooting 60 frames per second on their iPhone, and then being able to edit and upload that and watch it back instantly. So we've like removed the pain of making video. Not only do we have the language, but we have the tools. VR is totally the opposite, especially, you know, I mean, our first camera is GoPro rig based. It's a great starting point. A lot of the stuff is being repurposed, and it's very, very painful right now. There's a lot of technical hurdles. You don't get immediate feedback on what you shot. You know, my personal passion is to try to lower that boundary so that it, you get that instant feedback and you can start to make creative decisions. But right now, it's a bit of a mess. Yeah, previs is uh, your best friend. Um, I, I know a lot of people that may come from traditional backgrounds in, in filmmaking, storytelling, or used to doing storyboarding. Um, uh, if you're drawing stick figures, I mean, do it. That it's the best thing for you is that looking at the structure of people that are keeping the camera stationary versus moving it, no matter what you do, where camera placement is, is you have to be very aware of that. And you have to know that this, these cameras are shooting full 360. So, you know, we talked about it this weekend and, uh, one of the best tips was get get good at hiding. You know, um, you, you, you're going to see them in in a lot of the a lot of the live action stuff that is done to date has been short form. So you're you're seeing rigs, you're seeing that, and and I think a lot of that um, you're getting away with that nowadays because some of the experiences, uh, as the gentleman on the panel before had said, is uh, some of the experiences um, have missed the mark for some people. Some, some people have thought that there have been a lot of great experiences and you have the differences, you know, there's with Google's, with Justin Lin's, with Help, that was a really good example of mixing live action with CG and it was done really well. You're gonna see a lot more of those hybrids as well, as just like you guys are working on with the VFX yep. mixed with live action. Absolutely. And potentially game engines too. Yeah, and, and the, the technology that's available to us, like whether you're, you're versed in Unity or whatever other game engine you're using, whether you're um, using Color or Nuke or whatever the tools are that you're using to create your content, it's going to be, um, you know, a, a different tool for each job that you do. Mm -hmm. You know, you use GoPro for one job, you may use Jaunt Camera for another job. You know, there's going to be, it's just that there's enough tools out there for us to use as content creators and storytellers. Um, and that's, I think, the great thing about immersive uh, as, as far as the technology is out there. It's going so fast and sometimes it's a little inundating for people that are new to this that they don't know what to choose and sometimes they're, they come to panels like this, they come to uh, trade shows, E3, all this stuff. And, and you, I think all of you and all of us are asking the right questions to each other. I think the community at large is very supportive of each other. Well, um, listen, I'm sorry. It, yeah, it, it, it's also a problem that right now there is no solution that's a real cinematic uh, solution, right? There's no camera solution out there that really is for actual movies, right? And that's, and that's the biggest challenge is we were looking to do what we were doing. It, it, it was a change because we looked at every solution out there and, and some have their pros and some have their cons and we, we, we've even spoken about this, it, it, is that somebody's got to invent and they will and somebody will figure this out whether it's Red or Panavision or whoever will work it out. Or John. Or, or John, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but we think the camera should move a little more. Um, but it's great. Uh, uh, is, that, is that a solution that is actually a solution that if Spielberg wanted to shoot a 360 movie, what, what is that camera? Respectfully, probably not John. But there, but, but there is a solution out there that has yet to be invented. Maybe it's in development that, that is 
that is uh, that's going to have the frame rate that you need. That's going to have the the depth of field and the, and the dynamic range and all the other things that. And I'm not technical at all. If it's not totally obvious, but but but, but all the other things that an actual filmmaker can actually use and make an actual business out of it. And that's I've, the thing. And we're we're excited about that. We embrace that. That's coming up around the corner because everybody's talking about it. You know, and it'll be fantastic. Yeah, I think. I, I wouldn't get, and this is me saying this coming from a very technical background, I wouldn't really get caught up as much in the tech yep. of all of this because you see feature films that are being shot on iPhones that are having major success at Sundance and getting picked up. Mm -hmm. So yes, the technical is a very big part of this medium and these platforms. So it's hard to say, don't get caught up in it, but I'm saying if you're new to this, you're gonna go out there, you're gonna shoot, you're gonna shoot shit at first, <laughs> honestly. We, we shoot, when we first started with this, it was crap, you know? We've shot full days and it's been no good. And you're gonna learn from everything of that. Every shoot we go out and do, every shoot I'm sure John does and everybody on this panel learns a lesson, just like all of you are gonna do. Um, the, the cinematic side of having a solution for um, the professional crowd is, yes, it's a bit of a, of a working solution today. Is, it'll get there, it'll yeah, absolutely get it'll, there. And it'll get there quick. Absolutely. And Definitely. you know, I, I think between the options that are out there for us is that they're gonna evolve very quickly, they're gonna be available to all of us, and that's something I think a lot of us are doing is we're creating solutions for everybody it's not just for the Ridley Scotts and for the Michael Bays and all that. And, and I think that needs to happen for VR immersive as a whole to succeed. It can't just we're be. We're also talking about this without really giving any consideration in this conversation to how that video gets distributed and experienced. Yeah, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. I mean, so you make your 360 video. Where does it uh, go? What happens next, oh. right? Um, at the moment, if you make a 360 MP4, there's no kind of standard way to play it. Um, maybe you can put it up on YouTube 360. Now all that resolution just went to waste, that's right? right? I mean, that's, that's super right. low res. Um, or if you're like Weaver or John or some other people, you're actually investing in making player technology too to make that better. Like we have an HD player because yeah. of that. We're going you know, to the metals. We can't wait to build anything in Unity. You can't build a good video player in Unity. Um, so at least you basically gut all of Unity and have to write a bunch of native code anyway. Oh, you it's too. Already go, yeah, yeah, of course. You know? <laughs> so we didn't even bother. So we're, we're straight to the metal Android stack or Windows stack depending yeah. on where we're at. Um, so, you know, you got to think about that too. I mean, for some people, if they're trying to make, you know, GoPro action oriented 360 content that, want, that they want to get on YouTube, they're going to be fine with a two GoPro setup for a lot of stuff. Yeah. For other people, you know, like what you want to do, you may have to invest in the delivery technology as, as well. Well, right? yeah. well, listen, I think, I think the, the, the whole conversation about distribution and having distributed a, a, a ton of content worldwide, you know, literally in every territory around the world. I think that the marketplace is not yet ready for what we're talking about. Obviously, and, and we love YouTube. Friends with them, they're great. But that's not a monetizable platform. And while you want to give away content for free and you can have great branded entertainment all day and all night, at the end of the day, that's not going to build a business. So, so how do you create a monetizable distribution platform that's actually going to reach an audience and, and make that audience go, I, gotta, I have to have this and I'm willing to pay for it because until we have that solution, this is all a big jerk off, right? It's nothing, it's a waste of time. It's gotta be something where we, we create a real marketplace for this content. Um, the, 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 what's encouraging is you're seeing Netflix and you're seeing other players like that really jumping in, embracing VR, and you're gonna see them start spending money and buying content and, you know, and, and all the other players out there who are, there's some people who are trying to create marketplaces, but I, we think that, as the, this is our opinion, we, we, think, we think that the Netflix can take those people and squash them in about two seconds because they have an audience that's already there and embedded and everything else. Um, the distribution is definitely a challenge. It's something that we're focused on literally every single day. We already have a very specific distribution plan for our, our uh, movie that we're shooting and it's, it, it's something that's gonna be great. And, but that's a very specific thing with a very definable audience. That's the other point is that if we're gonna create content, let's identify the audience Let's figure out how to reach them. Let's see what they want, and then monetize that audience. Because up until then, you know, all the brands can create all the experiences they want, but 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 who cares, right? Let's let's make content for an audience that wants it and have it be organic for 360. Now, there was a, actually an interesting fact that we learned some uh, statistics this weekend that um, 
of the, a good amount of people kind of that were polled about that, the least, uh, I guess, least number or least statistic on there was uh, they were asking, what would you like to see in, in a VR platform? And movies was at the bottom, bottom right. which, was, which was pretty eye opening. What was at the top? Huh? What was at the top? Um, a leisure. Basically experiential, like I want to be experienced like this, and I'm on yeah. Hawaii. Yeah. I want to be in Fiji. You know, travel and leisure mm -hmm. was was at the top. Yeah, but the yeah, but percentage. is the qualification on that the people who have any real idea what VR even is? Because if you ask people what generally what VR is, the I read another study that said only 10, 20 percent really have any idea what VR. Yeah, and that actually and that is. is the big part. I think all of us and right. everyone here is um, we've got to educate. Everybody, we've got a big, right. a big job ahead of us. Is uh, and we cannot deny the the service that Google did for all of us with the New York Times release mm -hmm. of those million cardboards. Yeah. Whether whether people, every one of them, every million of those were opened up and put together, and and, and the app was downloaded, it, that doesn't fully matter. I would hope all million people would have done it, but. Um, the fact that that did just go out was a yeah. huge boom for, um, for I think all of us getting into that. And I well, think what, the educational part of that is we have to teach people how to consume content all mm -hmm. over again. Right. You know, whether it be through a Vive, whether it be through uh, PlayStation VR, cardboard, all of that. I think the easiest way that we've all been talking about is mobile is the gateway into. That's the broadest audience, absolutely. Yeah. Everybody has a mobile phone. Definitely. Right. You know? Um, yeah, well, there's desktop players. Yes, there's custom players. Yes, there's Google Cardboard and all this. But uh, well, let's create content that people actually care about. It's, it's funny. When, uh, when, when HD first came out, you remember this. Everybody, and I was at a conference like this, and, and I remember uh, there were some people there that were like the innovators in HD, and they started HDNet. And they, they, were, they were talking about how, oh, man, you can watch HD. It's like all bikini videos and nature videos. and. It's amazing, like it, it's, it's sort of like what 4K is now. It's amazing, but at the end of the day, nobody cares. At the end of the day, you have to have content that people actually care about, and some. And, and it's. I feel like we're in the, the same place. Up to this point, there's been a lot of content out there, a lot of live action content, especially that's all right. It's like I remember I was at Sundance this year, and there was the wild experience. So you're standing there, and it's and you're looking around, and there's Reese Witherspoon, and she walks up to you, and she stands there, and she looks around, and then she walks past you. Cares. Why do I need to see that in 360? Why does that matter? Why? What? Why? I, I, I could have had one camera, spent a lot less money, and filmed. I would have had the same experience. Let's organically create content that actually makes people say, "I have to have that content," and that's when they're buying the 360. So, uh, what will it take to get there to get those seminal pieces of content for VR? Actual in investment in the space, actual monetizable content, and a marketplace that is going to monetize that content. Yeah. Up until then, it's a big way. We, we can all speak hypothetically and everything else. Up until then, it's just a waste of time. We are, are, the focus of our business is all about monetization. And, and, and we know a lot of other companies that are trying to get there too. It's, it's, that's what it's going to take, we yeah. think. Well, but it also, I mean, it has to take advantage of the medium. Otherwise, you're back to your point, which is you could just put a single camera out there, right? Yeah. right. I mean, yeah. we're, we're just at the beginning. We're seeing just the earliest experiments in taking advantage of 360 as a medium where okay, they're trying to put the camera in the middle and you're surrounded by the action, like in the YouTube video, which was great for what it was, but yeah, you know, yeah. um, I don't think that's the future of all VR storytelling, having you in the center of a yeah, round table of people, but that, that is one sort of, you know, uh, uh, metaphor people are experimenting with. There's uh, the camera movement we talked about, but there's, you know, I, I think we barely scratched the surface on how to take advantage of being immersed Oh, and having the agency of being able to look around mm -hmm. and interact with that content. Well, that's a big thing, too. We go back to that is, you know, another reason why we maybe haven't seen the boom in, into, like, high-end cinematography, whether it be short or long form yet, is that all those guys and girls that are big-time directors, DPs, you know, all that, they don't know this language yet. They don't right. know how to stel tell stories in this well, well, listen, on these platforms yet. Absolutely, and, and also I'll, I'll take it a step further, and it's this, is that I was at AFM, American Film Market, for those who don't know, uh, last week, right? And I was at a party and I'm talking to, having friends with a lot of people in the fi film finance space. And the, these are the guys that finance content. These are the guys that finance movies and they, they create financing, all great, they 
film pre-sales, and there's all these complicated stru structures of how you make independent film these days. Studios are a little different, but, but I'm speaking to all these guys. And these are, I was in a room with probably 80% of the bankers uh, in, uh, in, uh, who are in this space. These guys had no idea what VR is. They have no concept of what it is. We, we, we started talking to them in general about what it is we're doing, and we even we played a little video of a, a reaction we had from Boston, I think I showed it to you guys. Um, and they're like, oh my god, this is amazing. But once those guys are educated, once those guys f figure out a way to monetize and, and invest or you know, lend money to create content, that's what it's going to take. And to your point, again, creating the distribution infrastructure, creating the monetization models on the back end will give those guys enough justification and comfort to invest in the front end. That's what this whole thing's about. Right? And so, and so it's getting those guys educated, it's getting the, the consumers educated. A lot of teaching you gotta do. It's gonna be a big pain in the ass. But we'll do so it. yeah, there is money in this space, it's just not there yet. Mm. So I'm curious, what new kinds of stories and storytelling does VR enable for creative people? What are, what are you guys excited about that you haven't yet seen? I'm excited for education and science, mm. big time. And Immersive, immersive storytelling for that way. And we, I think most of us know education and science leans more towards a documentary, S suits very well for that. Um, so you've got amazing stories being told by platforms like Nat Geo and BBC and all these others. And I, I think that type of storytelling um, is one that I'm excited for, other than obviously being excited for traditional cinema. Uh, who doesn't like a good action film um, but knowing those uh, parameters there would be like, would Mission Impossible be as good in 360? We, we don't know, would they but, have but, to do which, it? But. Which was a great point, and, yeah. and really at the end of the day, in terms of the genres that are, it could be really anything. Yeah. The key is, in our opinion, is how do you, how do you tell the story organically in, in, in 360, where it's not just, where all the action is happening here, so there's no reason to look all the way around us. So if you're gonna tell a story in 360, it's gotta be intended for 360, written for 360, and shot intentionally for that platform. So, so the payoff is there. I need to be able to look in all the directions to see what we're doing and have the story unfold all around us. And, and by the way, this is actually an amazing opportunity for the people in, all, in, the, in, in the media business because all of a sudden people, instead of watching a movie one time, right, you now have replayability like you do in games where people will be able to watch uh, the same movie, but three, four, five times, right, and have a totally different experience, yeah. and almost uh, a, a whole different, different story unfolds, or a different ending, or what? Uh, and, and then, of course, you get into the, and this gets more complicated, sort of the hybrid gaming movie thing, which 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 people are talking Back about. Back to now, big, doing, the comic book, right? Yeah. Yeah. Choose your own adventure. Yeah, right. A choose so. your own adventure type <laughs> experience that could be a hybrid live action gaming thing. Yeah. It, there's all kinds of opportunity there. The sky's the limit. It's just the yeah, and the Tarantino and Chris Nolan style storytelling where they're all just interleaved. Where it's all interwoven. That's right. Yeah, I mean, all of a sudden you can go through those in a bunch of different ways and right. not have the same experience. I wouldn't once want to tap that. That's amazing. Right. And, and by the way, and that's <laughs> and you can only do, that's the thing that's great about this. You can only do that in VR, right? Well, in, in our story, the thing we're shooting, well, now we've been shooting for a couple of days, but but I, the, the, when you look at the Passion of the Christ, this is an amazing movie. But there's nothing going to be more immersive, more amazing than be able to stand there and look up at Jesus as being crucified. <laughs> and I can look back here, and there's Mary, and there's right. There's there's nothing. Oh, there's no medium that you can do that with. But we yeah. engineered and designed the story so that we can tell. By the way, it's it's not like we engineered the story. The story was already told. But, <laughs> but although I'd like to take credit for that too, um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the we 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 constructed and engineered what we were doing specifically to be able to take advantage of that. And and that's what we'll to, to your answer to your question, Hansel, it's it's creating stories that unfold in the platform, not trying to force a round peg in a square hole. So I'd like to open up some questions. Do you guys have any questions? You know why though? Because we're dry, the action's here right the now. Here. So we're, we're, we're making your action, your gaze be here. If we had, if Daniel had run behind you, <laughs> that would have been your visual cue right. or your audio cue to do it. So it's, it's also how you uh, curate that, that story. 
and how you drive the action. A lot of it, yes, right now, early stages is some of it's very gimmicky in terms of like audio cues and visual cues going on there. But as a storyteller, you know, that's going to be dictated in the writing phase. You know, you have a good writer, they're going to know how to kind of block out with a director, block out that scene and be able to say, okay, you know, in a traditional one, you've got a 2D window here, is that we've been so used to of 100 plus years of cinema being directed just to this view, you know? And what happens is that view moves because the camera moves. So in this way, it's one giant camera that's capturing everything around it. And, you know, you do see people kind of doing 2D windows because that's what your iPhone is right now or your Android device. It's a 2D window into that 360 world. So that's kind of like in the same thing of well, driving just, that. Just to respond, though, I do, I do see your point, and I don't know if we always need 360. I mean, Rihanna just released this very shocking and graphic and, frankly, don't recommend it um, <laughs> video where you get, like, you know, your hand chopped off in first person. But they've actually, what was interesting about it to me is they actually block out the back half of your vision. And at first I was like, oh, there's nothing to see back there. So the first time I'm like, oh, okay, got it. And then I just stayed focused in the area that the director wanted me to see, and I didn't really mind. So I think that's part of the language we're establishing is like, oh, nothing to see back here. Gently reminded, now please look you know, in this general direction. Yeah, I mean, we can't forget one of the key aspects to VR is the full immersion. We're shutting out the outside world. And you know, the anecdotal evidence we're seeing for people just watching the, the 2D movies in a Netflix in someone else's virtual theater right now, people seem to like that, even though it's just inherently 2D video content. They're immersed, they're you know, basically cut off from the outside world, so they're more feeling like they're more fully in the story. Now that's Obviously, we want to take it much farther than that. But the idea is that you're fully immersed in that. The agency of being able to look around, that's cool, but it's absolutely not required. It's contextual. Right, it's, and it depends on the context of the story. So, yeah, that other 180 degrees, you've got to make it worth something. And we just Otherwise, saw two right. tests of that, too. Right. We just saw sports and uh, we saw political and democratic. Right. That was 180. That wasn't, they, everybody's labeled it as VR. Um, but in the shot, it was not a full 360 camera. Right. Question for, for Alex. Um, you mentioned I, that uh, you're not using a jaunt camera and the, uh, the movement of the camera is super important. Curious to hear what you did select and whether that's getting on that British Airways flight with you later on. It's, it's already there because we're already shooting. Uh, I, I can't tell you specifically what our rig is. We built our own rig out of necessity. I, I, I guess that's the mother of invention, truly. Um, we, uh, we, we built our own rig carefully to make sure that we don't have any issues. But, uh, but it's really about, about the workflow as well, uh, to make sure that you have a workflow. When, when you have 17 cameras, it's very difficult to stitch. There's some practical issues that, for me, are incredibly boring, but for other people, they seem to get really excited about it. Um, uh, it it's, it's about the, the workflow combined with, with the camera and understanding how you're gonna stitch on the back end. Because the, the, the problem you're seeing a lot these days, people, and we talked to a million people about this, right? The, the problem that we, we saw is that, is that you, you, sure, you can build a camera, but who cares? Who cares? To us, the camera's totally irrelevant, right? It's about the entire process and the entire workflow and the, the, whole, the whole ecosystem, if you will. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the reality is, is that it's about how do, you, how do you create a solution for your specific piece of content that it makes sense, because otherwise, it doesn't, don't bother, right? Does that answer your question? Without me being able to tell you exactly what, what, what <laughs> solution actually we it. built. You know, and, and, and by the way, this solution we built, it's not like we're, we're a camera company. We're not gonna try to go and sell the camera and build and raise financing on a camera. It's, for us, it was about the content and building a solution that was specifically for that, uh, that what we were shooting specifically. With, 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 sorry, last time I'll say about this. Without spending a million dollars in post, because you can shoot anything. I, I can sit here with my iPhone and I can shoot this, like this, and take, take a bunch of videos, and I'll, I'll pay ILM $5 million, and they'll create a 360 thing for me, but, but that doesn't make any sense. So we'll create a solution that makes sense at a price that is justifiable and not insane. The Christ Cam. The Christ Cam. Christ cam. The Christ Cam. You heard it. That's <laughs> good. That's the new one. That's, that's I new like one. that. Uh, you should okay. use that. <laughs> that's going to stick. You don't mind if I steal that, do you? I can take it. Oh, I already heard it. I already heard it. Okay, last question. Okay, so, um, I mean, I think you guys mentioned, like, the Google Cardboard, these sort of cell phone-based uh, viewing, viewing platforms probably being the entry point for a lot of this and how people are actually going to see this stuff in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you, I, I think about, like, a super sophisticated camera, like, are, are those systems going to really be able to take advantage of the, the, the res, like, 
are you gonna have to down res that anyway quite a bit just to you have to do it today right people right. are oversampling just to downsample yeah um, and it's it's technology is getting there very fast I mean look where we are today with the Vive and right. where other things that are coming out today. Um, Especially if you're just talking pixel resolution yeah. on the screens. I mean, that's a very solvable problem. I mean, yeah, there's a 4K right. phone coming out now-ish? Now-ish. Like, yeah. yeah, before yeah. the end of this year. We've yeah. got yeah. full 4K phones. We've got, we've got these viewing devices that are going to really catch up to it. But, I mean, we're oversampling for a couple reasons. Obviously, for pixel resolution on the HMDs, we're doing it also for future proofing. That's it, yeah. Right. Uh, yeah as right, well, that's a big thing. I mean, that's where the whole 4K thing comes into play is why people right. are shooting on RED and Alexa and all of this other right. stuff that's capable. Um, is is like you've it. got a lot of post-production solutions too by over sampling on your capture. Right, but, I, but, but, sorry, I mean, but, yeah, but it seems that the camera technology is always seems to be ahead of the, the display technology. Sure. And that's the problem. So you have 4K coming out now. We've had 4K cameras for, for a while. And there's there's that disparity that we have to remedy at some point. But well, there, there's a terminal resolution. Eye limiting resolution is like 11,600 or something approximately by 5,600. So at that point, you won't see any more pixels with your you know, your fovea. So then that's that's solved, right? There's a plenty of other issues to deal with. But You're that's saying that there's a ceiling on resolution? There is for what yeah, the human eye can detect, eye. yeah. There's only, right. But they'll still, yeah, but I, I, I did, we, when you talk to John Q. Public and they see a, a HD uh, video and then you put a 4K video of the same source content, they can't tell the difference. Well, there's, there's right, because no, it depends on how close you are to the screen. Right, so there's 8K, there'll be whatever. I don't, I don't, I'm not technical. So at some point, yeah, it'll get so great that, but who knows, it depends on. Yeah, yeah. that's why we moved to things like HDR and, and some other thing and light field. Yeah. And, and yeah. Th the backfill kind of catches up to the technology of the, uh, the pixel. You know, yeah. in terms of that. All right. I the other thing is that like, <laughs> the democratization of this is so, I mean, I feel like yeah, because this medium is really enabling teleportation, like temporal teleportation to different moments in people's lives. Like, mm -hmm. it seems like the democratization of that is going to be so key because, like, honestly, if people can watch their wedding 20 different ways from different perspectives, yeah. I mean, that seems like what that might drive a lot of the desire for this content. Well, if you sh I look at it, I have kids. So if I shoot my five-year-old's birthday today and she's 27 down the road and she can relive that experience with people that have passed on, that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. That's and like these devices really are really good at doing video. And as we get these, I mean, more so than doing game engine stuff, oh, right? Yeah. So the cinematic media are, are gonna be better for this form factor. And as soon as uh, Google gets the jank out of cardboard tracking, the head tracking, I mean, we get the resolution that's getting good enough. Uh, I, I think the head tracking is going to come soon enough as well. well. The Qualcomm guy said it's coming next year, right? Yeah, no, I mean, we're phone. talking next year for that stuff. Yeah, for positional tracking. Just wait for consumer yeah. capable depth sensing cameras and you never know. Then you never know. It will look so quaint. I know, yes. exactly. Okay, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>